Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure. We are slightly behind the schedule, but thanks to you, we can skip the next slide. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, what give leaders the biggest headache? It's basically a free translation of the name of my company's research project. The Polish name was Sogryzie Liderów. I would gladly welcome somebody offering better, offering me, offering me better translation. Uh, what was this about? It was a detailed survey. Uh, we asked 621 uh, leaders of various positions what, say, prevents them from doing their work effectively, what burns them out, what basically sucks at uh, their work. The, pr the presentation plan, basically all, oh, and the goal. My goal is to familiarize with you with those challenges, but also to make you feel better about yourselves and your organization. I'm sometimes kidding that uh, I'm a part-time, since I became this trainer, consultant, I'm part-time uh, psychotherapist because I'm visiting teams and I tell them that, hey, it's normal that the projects are delayed. It's normal that the teams are unmotivated or it's normal when the client changes their mind all the time. So hopefully you're gonna feel better after the presentation. Uh, we're gonna start with some lessons learned. Then we're gonna go through demographics. <laughs> Jürgen's presentation was with pictures. My will be full of charts. Uh, <laughs> but none of them goes upward. So uh, at least that's going to be original. Uh, then we're going to move to the winners. I mean, say there are Oscars and there are golden raspberries, right? Uh, for the worst movies. So then we're going to move to the golden raspberry of management. And finally, I'll try to offer some conclusion or ideas what to do about those challenges. Lessons learned. This could be interesting if you are surveying clients, teams, or uh, especially if, if it's like a, if, if there is some maybe newer, bigger survey project ahead of you. Uh, key lessons learned from our project. <sighs> Don't try to kill two birds with one stone. It's a, it was the third edition of our project. And in the previous ones, we just could not resist asking uh, additional questions that interest us. Like, for instance, we are training companies. So we are asking people, uh, uh, what kind of trainings do you like, whatever. Or we are interested in personality types of the, of, the, of the respondents. And the previous survey was basically, I think, like 27 questions, 15 mandatory. 100 people responded. And we had to response rate, like finish rate, around 30%. This year, we are, we are really like merciless uh, when adding the, the scope of the survey. We ended up with 17 questions. Seven were only mandatory, and we managed to achieve 67% completion rate. So make your surveys short. Uh, test how people understand what you've written before publishing. Even if you consider yourself the best communicator in the world, we are truly astonished that we had to rewrite many questions many times in order for them to be like truly un truly unambiguous because we write one thing it was obvious that this question means this means a and then people said oh no it means b or c or d or whatever so do test it uh, and third don't ask to underestimate time necessary to analyze the data. This is the third time we do such project and the third time we have major delay with publishing the results, especially if there are like lots of open te text answers that are interesting, uh, uh, lots of dimensions that we could look, uh, look at it. Yeah, so a bit of demography. Uh, oh. Previous editions were only focused on project managers, project leaders. Uh, this edition, we decided to extend the scope and add, say, leadership positions, various leadership positions. So we had project managers, but also team leaders, mid, mid and top management, and the, the category we called agile leaders. So scrum masters, product owners, and agile coaches. Uh, here you see, can see the distribution of answers. Uh, and of, uh, already funny thing, uh, lots of people chose like the other option, 
and they were answering like, I'm a little bit, bit of everything. And this was especially prevalent, surprise, surprise, in the last category, Agile leaders. Uh, I don't know if Ken Schwaber would like this, would like to hear this, but many people wrote, hey, I'm uh, partially Agile coach, partially Scrum master, and partially product owner. Uh, gender, age, experience. Uh, Roughly 50% of the respondents were, uh, say, intermediate level, had intermediate level of experience, three to nine years, and then half half rookies and really experienced people. What was really surprising to us was that, say, the distribution of leadership experience was very similar in, also in the mid top management group as well. So, well, initially I expected that if you have a lot of experience, then you advance to top top positions, but apparently it's not it's not the case. Initially, we also suspected that maybe we also reached only the younger people, hence they don't have that much experience. But we checked the results for that group, and what like fifty five? I have notes here. Fifty five percent of people were above thirty five years old. So like maybe it's not the experience. That makes you that make you advance to the top of the organization. Maybe it's some gift or whatever, or maybe also sometimes it's gender, uh, because the gender distribution for the bottom management position, so project manager, team leader, agile leader, was 60 to 40 percent. 60 percent women, 40 percent men. It was exact opposite for mid and top management position. So there we had 60% guys, 40% girls. Uh, two people preferred not to share the gender, nobody responded other. Uh, current employers, size and location. We achieved more or less equal distribution between small, mid and large uh, uh, firms. It's good. I mean, because hopefully we are avoiding bias towards more corporate or, or more startup perspective. Uh, and also roughly 50-50 between international and Polish company. This other category is people uh, who are who either work abroad or work remotely for company abroad that doesn't have any, uh, it's not present in Poland. Uh, in this category, agile, I mean, so in the size of company, agile leaders are the outliers. Because as you can see, 56% uh, of them work for large companies versus average 39%. 50% out of this, uh, those are large corporations. So 2,500 people and more. So it goes against the perception that the small companies are, are those, you know, agile, swift. It was actually pretty surprising uh, to me to, to find out that the smaller co the company, the fewer agile positions are there. Any thoughts? They, don't need, uh, agile leaders. they are just they agile by design. design yeah. Okay, so so the bigger the organization, uh, the more they need people who who's, who gonna make this organization agile. Maybe, Maybe. yeah. Uh, uh, What's also worth noting that there was no difference between the number of agile leaders in Polish and international companies, but there is a twist there. We're gonna get to the twist. Uh, uh, more leaders on average were working for operation-focused organizations than project-focused organizations. Operation-focused organizations are like, you know, banks, retails, retail manufacturing, things like that. So where most of the business of the company is this business as usual, not projects. Um, and the distribution was more or less similar in all those cohorts. Uh, uh, so what it means? It means that for most of those leaders, projects are side gigs. And it, this, this is even more true for their teams. Maybe that the leader is dedicated to the project, but they have to do the project with people who are mostly engaged in the operational work. So they don't have that much time uh, for, 
for the project work. This is even more true for stakeholders, right? Uh, so people who need to provide information, support, things like that. So, okay, this is like a random survey, right? This might not be completely representative. Uh, but still, this gives the idea like, like that the huge chunk of people who are doing projects are working in an operations environment. Uh, and yet, most training programs and frameworks paint the picture of having 100% dedicated team, right? When I've been doing my PMP certification, project management certification, long time ago, there was a, there was like a pro, pro process acquire project team, develop project team, and they 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 assume that I'm gonna have a project team 100 percent dedicated. When I've been doing Kanban certification, we had those you know formulas for throughput and everything, and I instantly asked the question, hey, but how how can I calculate it if from sprint to sprint I have some people pulled from the team, added to the team, uh, and it constantly changes. And the answer was, well, in such case, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for half of project leaders. Uh, remote work, a standard or a privilege? So as you can see, both extremes, so both harbingers of the, say, very pro, remote work and very anti-remote uh, work, they are not right. Most people ended up somewhere in between. Uh, some kind of hybrid arrangement. By fixed hybrid and flexi hybrid, I mean fixed hybrid is, uh, flexi means whatever you do, there is office, you can just come to the office. With fixed, uh, this is the arrangement like, okay, uh, two days out of five, you have to be in the office, things things like that. Uh, there is a quite a significant difference between project managers and agile leaders here. Guess who has to be more in the office, project managers or agile leaders? Of course, only 1% of agile leaders have to work in the office in contrast to 24% of project managers. So if you are in love with your office, do not apply for Scrum Master or anything, just go for it project leader and 70 percent of agile leaders don't have to visit the office at all so this is like combined remote plus flexi hybrid uh, i especially loved this uh, category uh, rate the company the rate the culture of your company i'm going to explain this complicated graph in a second basically we ask the respondents to rate their company culture on a scale scale from one to five stars like the hotel right uh, like one star means that people are stealing milk from the fridge and five, it means that, you know, you know, your kids names, everybody's happy, you know, YMCA generally. Uh, the, the first insight, actually, it's not, I resisted putting much more charts here. So some charts are not present. Uh, uh, and this is, this is, this is related to this first bullet point. It seems. Uh, this is interesting insight. It seems that the best uh, place to do projects is either a small organization or a big organization. People from medium organization basically say that their organizational culture sucks because 24% uh, of them have given two stars or less, while the average is 12. Uh, and only 7% awarded, awarded five star rating. So why do you think people from mid medium-sized organizations struggle? I have some idea. That that would that would that would be exactly my take. If you are a small organization, uh, you don't need many processes. Things just work because you know people. You can have those water cooler conversations. Uh, you like a, one big family. Uh, if you are a big mature organization, you already have probably lots of hopefully useful processes, uh, beaten paths. You know how things works. And some some uh, somewhere in between, there is this place where water cooler conversations don't work already but you don't have this maturity. 
yet. That would be my guess. Uh, Agile leaders rate their company culture a bit better than the average. Also, none, not a single person rated their, uh, their company as one-star culture. Good. But you know what? It's, uh, I, have, I, I have a funny insight. Sorry, Jacek, for that. <laughs> because uh, uh, medium and top man mid, mid top managers are the happiest with their companies. 64% have given either four or five star rating. That's 8% more than average. But you know that maybe, just maybe, the top management thinks that it's better than it really is. That would be, that would be uh, my guess. Maybe not, but that, that was basically the first thing that came, that came to my mind. Uh, what else? Oh, who is, the, who is the client? Roughly half, half external and internal clients, right? Those of you who worked in both environments know that it's completely uh, different type of work. And the nationality, uh, we not asked about nationality of the company, but also we asked about the nationality of the client, say the majority of people on the client's team. Uh, average is roughly half half, but in here we have a difference. For agile leaders, 63% uh, of them work for international clients, while only 43% of project managers work for international clients. I don't know. International client clients prefer to work with product owners instead of project managers. So, oh, and I mentioned in the beginning that the fewer questions, the better. But there was just, just, just this one question I couldn't resist asking about the tool set. Uh, so the one essential tool, we, we, the question was, name one single tool that's absolutely essential in your work. Uh, and we're going to start with Agile leaders. What do you think? Which tool won? <laughs> yeah. Jira, the whole suite. Then we had this eclectic category of, uh, and then Kanban boards. Yes, I'm very happy. I could also think like, you know, this, there is some Kanban there because I'm a Kanban fanatic. So I like to interpret the results as they are. And we're going to compare it to project managers. Who, what kind of tool is the winner, do you think, in a project manager? Excellent. <laughs> and you see a beautiful comparison, right? Uh, the Excel here is like 3%. And in there, there's a, it's a winner. Then MS Teams, then Jira already as, you know, as the third one. Uh, and Again, I love this, this, this project of ours because I always have this malicious satisfaction to note that not a single Agile leader has listed Microsoft Project or any other Gantt chart tool, and only 2% of project managers have listed Microsoft Project as a top tool. And guess what Like the mandatory subject on all postgraduate studies in project management MS project, right? People, people, people graduate. They cannot write a, a good minutes of meeting, like a good minute summary, but they can draw a really nice Gantt chart. I, uh, I was also. I think uh, I, I would, I would add Kanban to this because Jira. In Jira, people also use, use, use Kanban boards. In here, I think uh, uh, the, we also said that this includes like physical Kanban boards. I, I, love, I love physical Kanban boards, but for distributed teams, more people will, will, will use that. At, at least, you know, I love Kanban, so I'd like to lie to myself that Jira, <laughs> Jira, that Jira is also, that Jira is also, uh, Jira is also Kanban. Okay. Demographics. Enough of demographics. Now it's time for golden raspberries. We have four categories. Mid, top management, agile leaders, project managers, and team leaders. So what, aha, and of course, we're going to go into details, but we decided, okay, details are nice, but we would like to have like the three main categories and choose 
in which category is the worst. So the, those main categories are the team, the client, or the other stakeholders, especially your boss, uh, the management board, other departments. So what do you think? Who's the winner in, in, this, in the first category? The client, the team, or other stakeholders? The rest of the other stakeholders, 50%. And in Agile Leaders? Other stakeholders. And in project managers, other stakeholders. And in team leaders, other stakeholders. So boss, other departments. Uh, so the overall wave averages. So for the for, for all the respondents, 57% other stakeholders. This is not a marginal victory. This is more than the two other categories combined. Right? And most of our trainings, we focus where? On the team. <laughs> I don't know which, which goes first, right? Uh, we don't have that many problems with the team because we have so many trainings or maybe we don't have so many trainings because it's much easier to do the training about the team. I don't know. Uh, yeah, some details. So let's start with this top category, problems with other departments. And definite winners, we have chaos, unclear expectations and priorities, and silo mentality, politics instead of collaboration. Uh, two most interesting observations here when comparing. Uh, a, de a definite winner for the agile leader and project management group was silo mentality, even higher than here. This, is, this was not the case for, uh, for medium, uh, so, so sorry, so mid top level managers and team leaders. <laughs> My thought was that we are living, mo most of organizations now are matrix organizations, right? We have this line hierarchy, this say, strong hierarchy. Like we have those managers that they can fire you. They can give you a raise. They can give you a bonus. And then we have those functional managers, project managers, product owners. Scrum masters, so those people that cannot, you know, don't have the power to approve your holiday or or or, or fire you, and it seems like uh, those matrix managers, so project managers and agile leaders, they struggle with silo mentality because they don't have this uh, this authority coming from from say the type of their position. They have trouble reaching to other silos. This is not the problem for say line managers. So if you're going to go to your line manager on one-on-one -on -one and complain about silos in your company, they may not understand you because they might not have this problem. Uh, and the second uh, is not very say, optimistic because both winners of this most important category are structural problems, right? chaos and clear expectations and silo mentality. This is pretty difficult to change. And especially it's not in the power to change such thing uh, for say junior scrum master or, or junior, junior project manager. I mean, they have to cooperate with uh, a manager from a different, of a different department, 20 years senior to them. Good luck. Some quotes, I love the quotes. Quotes are, I love, I don't know. Quotes are interesting, because, although sometimes they are depressing. I did not expect that there is so much politics in project management. Someone else signs a contract with unrealistic deadlines, and I have to either lie or pretend that I'm an idiot. Because if I was completely honest, it would kill team's motivation and make the client leave us. <laughs> Our executive board consists of three people who, instead of working together, constantly try to prove who's the most important one of them. This conflict, of course, cascades down the ladder. I have a short list with five vendors from hell, and I can't change them. When I ask my manager why, he tells me that the HQ wouldn't approve it. We have a master-slave relationship between sales and delivery. Since sales brings money, they get a final call with most decisions, even if they have no technical competence in a given area. If I need to get something from other department, like legal or IT security, I have to grovel before them. 
escalations don't work. The only way is to put on a fake smile and buy them cookies. So cookies as the tool, uh, you know, to conquer silos. Actually, Jurgen also mentioned cookies. So <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we're going to add it to management 3.0. Uh, problems with the client. Can't get important information and decisions from them. They change their mind and are surprised that it impacts budget and schedule. They don't know what they want. Those are the three top. Uh, there was no significant difference between survey groups. It means that the problems are pretty much universal. But my insight here, what I, what I noticed was that especially looking at the, say, first and the third category, they add up to 54%. And if you think about it, then in those situations, uh, bottom-up estimating makes absolutely no sense. Bottom-up, I mean, you create some product backlog and you try to estimate the parts of it. I mean, you can have the best experts. They could spend a lot of time estimating this. But if you can't, if you later, as the project starts, you can't get the information from the client, those eight estimates could be absolutely the best in the world. The project will be delayed anyway. So what to do in such cases? How to estimate, I mean, in other words, how to try to estimate your project if you are running constantly into trouble, like you can't get those informations or the client doesn't know what they want. And when it's six, <laughs> then we win. Other. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. This is this historical data. Uh, if you have a lot of data, there is this thing called Monte Carlo analysis. Then you don't, then you are using data from previous projects. So basically, top down estimation based on your experience. This is this is this is probably the only. Uh, this is the way. Us. Yeah, some people know. Uh, oh, and I had a question. Why? So why during the trainings we only focus on bottom-up estimating? You know, planning because it's easier. It's easier to teach. You know, it takes a good chunk of the training. People are happy. They construct product backlog. They learn the planning poker, things like that, and everybody's happy. They get a certificate. Congratulations. And then they have the leader, the client that doesn't answer email. Uh, problems with the client. Client doesn't want to interact with project managers and considers them redundant. They bypass them and talk directly with tech people, tech people who are unaware of all the intricacies like overhead costs, buffers, etc. Give the client overly optimistic estimates. These estimates have to be later renegotiated by the project managers. What makes the client hate them even more? <laughs> Very nice cycle. Uh, we have an internal client who doesn't care about the project. They just give us some high level requests and never bother to clarify. They won't be the ones using project results. They won't pay for it. So why should they care? People who work for inter on internal projects might know what it means. The client, uh, <laughs> the internal client imposed using Scrum and product management approach in teams that deal with infrastructure and support. Now we've got product owners in places where we desperately need tech leads and architects. We have inflation, costs going up everywhere, and our main client squeezes us to get even lower price. And then it's surprise that it impacts quality. The team, only 50%, but still there are some problems. Uh, definite winner, on-time delivery. Problems with on-time delivery, and that people have to keep chasing the team to get the results, then the quality of the deliverables, those are basically, this, this forms more than 50% of answers. But it's worth noting that agile leaders don't have the problem with on-time delivery. Average is 30%, but only 11% of agile leaders have problem with that. So kudos. Or it might be the case of nature of their teams. They work closely with, more closely with the teams uh so it's slightly different nature but still good to know 
Uh, there was a significant number of Agile leaders selecting other problems, and quite a few wrote there, I have no problem with the team. This was the only category that wrote, wrote such things. So kudos again. Uh, on the other hand, also only Agile leaders mentioned uh, beha toxic behaviors like aggressive communication, disregard for soft skills, and empathy. This made me thinking like, hmm, Agile leaders means IT, means empathy issues, but I would not, not like to go down that path. Probably it's much more complicated. Maybe Agile leaders are much more, say, aware, uh, and they, 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 they can actually, uh, say, notice those problems. Quotes. Half of the team refuses to use Jira. I can't understand why someone prefers that I visit them at, at their desk to get the status update instead of just updating it in the system. My current team is totally passive and reactive. They just wait to have tasks assigned to them and that's it. I have to come up with ideas and solve problems for them. It's difficult for me because I have experience with much better teams. I live in a resource sharing nightmare. We have a small tech team and large number of projects. Some guys are on seven projects at a time. Seems like we spend more time updating priorities and assignments than doing actual work. That was my experience in one of the previous companies. <laughs> yeah. You literally had to confirm three times a day that the developer actually continues to work on your project, that somebody else has not stolen them in the meantime. Yeah, that's that actually that's actually a good remark. People put it in this category. Uh, yeah, and this what I mentioned: aggressive communication, disregard for soft skills and diplomacy. People with intense temperaments and big egos. Nice people, interesting teams, right? <laughs> uh, we could draw a personal maps for them, and this would help. Um, anyway, the conclusion. Uh, what to do about it. And again, I have actually, this is the same slide like from the previous summary. Uh, this, because this, again, in my opinion, the solution to most, of, to most of those problems is not a new process or management framework. No, sending you to pre-institute training or whatever training won't solve that many problems. I came up with, with like three directions that may help. I'd like you also to challenge and discuss it. Uh, the first, I think, and most important is learning how to be like truly assertive. Like by truly assertive, it means I respect others and their positions, but I also respect myself and I can set clear boundaries. This is especially uh, like crucial in those situations when you have this client that wants you to do the project, but they don't pr pr provide you with, with the information. Too many times I've seen those, this uh, Prometheus syndrome. Like the leader is in this situation, they have no information from the client, but they still strive and, you know, sacrifice to save the project, right? They burn out completely. They burn out completely, and in order to you know to prevent this Prometheus symbol syndrome, sometimes you have to visit such presentation, sometimes read a book, sometimes go to therapy. I think that's one of the say most common uh, things I encounter during my mentoring gigs. I recognize it very well because I used to also suffer from the Prometheus syndrome even in my consulting career. I visit a company, this company is beyond salvation, it's imp absolutely impossible. Like you have those three founders that, I, that are constantly fighting with each other, but you want to help them. Relationship building. Uh, so learning to be more open to others' perspectives. When I, you know, when I started, I had this typical attitude. I used to work in the implementation department. So who uh, we hated both the production department so the people who were actually writing the software because they were writing it you know there were too many bugs and it was too slow and you, uh, but the department we hated the most was of course sales 
because that they promised all of that and then we had to deliver deliver it gradually over time i learned the perspective from other departments and they are not as, as bad as i initially thought uh, they are and this is this is basically the only way to 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 navigate in a silo mental in a silo organization because as i mentioned i mean <laughs> It, won't, it probably won't change. People are having lots of talks about silo mentality. But as I've already mentioned, this is the pain for project managers and agile leaders, but not such a big pain for line managers who actually have the mo most authority And if it's uh, in such organization. If it's not such a big problem for them, they, will probably not, they probably won't be that keen to actually change it. So we have to learn to live with it. <laughs> uh, final uh take taking a good care of your well-being so i noticed the better the better you feel uh, say the more rested the more happy you are the more internal say mind power you have to uh, to fight with all those challenges the the say the there there is less probability that you're going to break during such some meeting and you're going to start shouting at your client or difficult stakeholder happened to me once but it's a month it's a, a topic for a for a different talk any other ideas what would you do about those challenges i mentioned people have to change the system because all yeah. the things you listed are beautiful but i have uh, doubts if we should how possible is to learn all of that uh, in a working place you right know, also working with people with teams where, where there are you know huge problems with communication right so what i can do is to you know name something mm -hmm. show them examples but you know often it's not you know it's not enough yeah but so i have better results when i you know talk to them about how the system works mm -hmm. the place in the you know in this environment how they can you know, they can empower themselves to, to change mm -hmm. everything, but working more on the structures, on the processes, right. on the things like that. And this is probably related to my beliefs about how people, you know, yeah. act. But, but I, 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 what I would extract from what you said is, look at, say, everything you would like to change and look for things that you can actually change, because yes, that's actually a bitter remark but for many of those say especially open text answers uh maybe not from the most but from many there was this attitude like my company sucks my manager sucks my client sucks my team sucks i'm the only one who's like smart and nice and i'm just waiting for the management to change something right so, but but sometimes you you okay. Sometimes you might not send some people to CRP or change them or whatever. But you might try to change the system so that it's say encourages better uh, better behavior. Something may, may be closely related to what Jurgen uh, to what Jurgen said previously. Any other remarks, ideas, David? Why you are drowning with all those tasks? Uh, I prefer to sometimes ask for forgiveness. Not for permission. Uh huh. What to do or what not to do. If, if the environment is hard to, to resist mm -hmm. change, and I use all my toolkit to mm -hmm. change, you gotta say, okay, sorry, I forget about it. I didn't. Yeah. It. Actually, actually, I. I'll... Better and, and stay yeah, sometimes break break the rules or slightly bend them or whatever. Your client is not responsive, so think what might they want. Deliver this something and say, "Hey, you weren't answering. This is the best we could come up with." Right, right. Uh, I like mm -hmm. I like very well what yes. uh, what we could like do to improve our let's say day to day and our also uh, agile but 
we need to remember, I think, that this is a training also, yeah? Like, learning how to be truly assertive. It's not like... What it's the process, you? right. There's like a... This is the focus on the past, rather, and like understanding yourself, which is important to like uh, implement these things. But the next step is more like about coaching, yeah? To actually learn this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's why mentor <laughs> inter inter company intra company mentoring programs are are nice when they say manager who's like 15 years senior they will come to you and say hey don't worry <laughs> mm -hmm. top management is more pleased more content with the organization maybe Maybe, yeah. That that's also that's also one of the reasons they already have this distance. I mean, I look at myself from 15 years ago. I was this Prometheus, so stressed. Yeah. Now I know that some things just don't have to be perfect. Let's put let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, if you're gonna have any questions later on, I'm gonna be here around. As, I, as I've mentioned, uh, we have slight delay. But for those of you who are English speakers, you can sign up here. And once we have the English version of the report, we're going to send it to you. For the Polish speakers, uh, around you know every six weeks, we are sending out uh, a really short uh, newsletter. We're going to be informed uh, about the report there. And as usual, do connect and harass me with questions on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.